Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever Channel 781 event with a live audience, Civic Engagement Beyond Voting. I'm here with about 20 people who want to get more involved in the Waltham community, as well as our panelists. I'm going to turn it over to Chris in a moment to explain why we're here. Um, but just so you know, you know Chris as the host of our debrief show. Um, he also ran for city council and he's worked on many state and local campaigns. He's also either the co-founder of or volunteered for or worked for a long list of important organizations in Waltham, including Food Not Bombs, Healthy Waltham, the Community Day Center, Progressive Waltham, Waltham DSA, Waltham Pride, Critical Mass, and soon the Starbucks Employees Union. So, uh, Chris, it's all yours. So, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you all for being here or for watching online. Uh, we here at 71 News wanted to come together to uh, mark January 2023, an oral election year, with an event hoping to inspire new folks to get more involved in their community, maybe get uh, involved in ways you hadn't before, and then also to reinvig reinvigorate the familiar faces uh, who have done similar things in the past and hopefully learn a new thing or two. So we came up with uh, Civic Engagement Beyond Voting. Um, I can't take credit for the good title, but it uh, really hits home for me. I think there's a lot of... Uh, there's many people in Waltham that are living out their lives happily um, and they vote in every single election. Uh, they care about things like affordable housing and climate change and working class power. And uh, even though they vote in every election, they are dissatisfied with the status quo of Waltham. They have the good politics, they watch the good news uh, and they vote for the good candidates, but nothing seems to change that much. Um, I am imploring these residents, uh, these well-meaning residents, that nothing is going to change in the city unless you personally get more involved. Going to meetings, volunteering your time, calling or emailing your representatives, but most importantly, doing it with other people. Overwhelming public pressure is, as an observer of all of this, um, one of the only ways to affect real change in the city. And the only thing that's better than a thousand people all individually saying, I believe this one thing is a thousand people all coming together to say that we, the thousand people, believe this one thing. That is powerful and it is undeniable. And a thousand people is totally doable in a city like Waltham, but availability of information and uh, lack of media makes it difficult. Waltham is a city of 78,000 people based on the most recent US census. We're not a small city, uh, but for a, a lot of empirical reasons, it does feel that way. It does feel like a small city. I'm from a much smaller town. I grew up in, in Mount Pocono, Pennsylvania with a population of 4,000 people. Uh, and unlike Waltham, we still have a newspaper. We have a citizen's newspaper that's super active. Uh, the government there lacks transparency in a lot of ways too, uh, but there's public input at the beginning of every meeting to air grievances. Um, and while the number of people voting in Mount Pocono is very, very small, um, the overall percentage based on uh, population is higher than Waltham. Um, I've knocked on thousands of doors in Waltham, volunteered my time with many organizations that Josh just listed. Um, and uh, ran for city council myself. And a recurring theme is uh, that I hear from people is a lack of information, not only about uh, like what's going on in the city government, but really just what's going on in the city, uh, happenings going on in the city. And uh, people desire that, people want that. So more than a year ago, I talked with some friends about putting together a new project, uh, hopefully to remedy this. It's called Channel 71 News, a local independent media organization with the emphasis uh, starting on weekly city council debriefs. It's gone really well in its first year, and uh, we have a very dedicated listening audience that tunes in every week. Um, I hope that this can be useful in the coming election year, as we are the, really the only people doing this kind of thing, not only reporting on the news, but also giving our opinion about it and providing historical anecdotes that make them interesting, um, connecting the dots between issues and across people. Um, so I hope that, that this is a tool that people use and feel inspired by. This is a mayoral election year, so turnout will be higher than if the mayor wasn't on the ballot. It's a good opportunity to try to capture attention. Um, we'll probably see 33 to 35% of people voting if it trends the same way as it has in the past. That's unfortunately not very high. Um, and that's only the number of registered voters. That's not even taken into account the unregistered voters, which there are many of. 
uh, but it is better than the around 20 to 22 percent of non-mayoral years. Um, so hopefully we can capture attention of, the, of these voters and inspire them to stay more involved after they cast the ballot. Um, Today, we are going to be hearing from five people who at some point in their lives uh, had the audacity to participate in the community. Uh, all living in Waltham and all involved in some way in the city. Uh, I've grown to call them all my friends and I'm proud of all the work that they do. Um, they've spent thousands of hours collectively talking to Waltham residents about issues in the city. I'm honored to have them all here today and looking forward to hearing those stories. I hope that you learn from them as well and get inspired to take that step in donating just a little bit of your time uh, to the community. It really doesn't take much, an hour here, an hour there, uh, breaking the ice of discomfort around participating, uh, learning best practices, and then really getting good at them. And then we change the course of Waltham history together, just like that. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Josh Castorp again, a uh, great partner of mine in Channel 71 News, and uh, who makes a lot of this possible. He will facilitate the flow of the next hour or so. Uh, we'll hear from two pairs of people, uh, volunteers from campaigns and past candidates for city council in Waltham, and then we'll hear from one sitting city councilor. Um, at the end of each panel, which is three in total, um, there'll be time set aside for questions from the audience. Josh just said this, but you can either put questions in the chat or click on the raise hand symbol in the bottom of your screen and Josh will call on you to unmute. Um, Josh will read the questions he finds appropriate if, in the chat um, and the panelists will respond or Josh will call on you to unmute and then uh, the panelists will respond. If everything goes well, that's how the evening will progress. Um, and yeah, without further ado, uh, thank you once again for all being here and thank you for all the panelists for donating your time and energy once again uh, to make all them a more equitable place uh, for everyone that lives in it. So thank you very much and uh, you can take it away, Josh. Thanks, Chris. So our first panelist, uh, like all of the panelists, has a bunch of different roles in the community that he can tell you all about, but he's here mainly to represent uh, what it's like to volunteer on a campaign, and that's Eamon Dawes. So Eamon, it's all yours. Wonderful. Thanks, Josh. Um, Thank you to Channel 781 News. It's exciting to be here. Uh, a little background on me when I, it goes, elections uh, go way back. So I've always been active in elections. I think back to my parents. They would always take me to the polls when they would go and vote. And there was even a few times I would uh, hold signs with them every now and then outside our polling places. Uh, sort of as I got older, middle school, high school, I would always follow the town meetings we had back home. And both my parents were teachers. So on some lucky Thursday nights, uh, I would be watching school committee with them. Um, I, I just grew up in an environment where local politics were treated with importance. So when I moved to Waltham six or seven years ago, um, sort of that choice to move to Waltham, that choice to live in Waltham, the choice to be a resident of Waltham, to me, that's one that requires political activity. I'm a member of this community that has been formed over the centuries by politics and by residents coming together and organizing and building this city. And I feel an obligation as one of its current residents to continue that story. Um, you know, being a resident and being politically active are deeply linked to me. Uh, so when we talk about voting, I see this as a real disconnect. Um, you know, Chris mentioned that, you know, he wants us to do things together, do things with other people. Um, but voting, as you know, is a solitary activity. Um, you know, when we vote, they give us a privacy folder. We get a little cubicle they put us in. It's not, it, it is a political activity, but it, it is one that it, we don't engage with our neighbors. We don't ask questions. We don't debate. Um, even if you get a flyer in the mail from a candidate, you aren't engaging with the candidate. If you are reading an interview that the candidate gave, um, you know, you can't follow up with those questions. So while voting, it's a required part of our political process, it doesn't enrich our community. It doesn't build on our political base. Um, and if you think about where, uh, as a resident, we can discuss, debate, and question our elected leaders, voting day is the absolute end of that process. It is the absolute end of the campaign. Um, you know, it's like saying that you're a football fan and only watching the Super Bowl, um, to use somewhat of a timely analogy. You're only catching sort of those final crumbs of political engagement. So as this talk uh, is titled Beyond Elections, 
we look and we understand that most of the politics, most of that community building, you know, happens uh, before election day. Um, and this is why, you know, campaigning is required to strengthen our city. It's required to, um, you know, create that uh, political strength that and community that communities like Waltham are founded on. Um, one thing we find in Waltham is that even when people do vote, many of the seats are uncontested. Um, and that's because at least our political muscles here in Waltham, uh, you know, the ones that keep elected accountable and challenge their ideas are really weak muscles. Um, you know, as a city, we should be fielding many more candidates than we do. Uh, contested races make for better candidates and a better Waltham. Uh, because when you campaign, even if, you know, your candidate loses, it connects neighbors and it shares ideas. Um, so there's been a few campaigns that I have, you know, volunteered for. I, I think I know the first thing I did, uh, at least locally, was Allison Leary's campaign. So she ran for a uh, state rep seat that is uh, that John Lawn has uh, back in 2020. I volunteered on Chris's uh, city council campaign last year, this year. I was uh, on some of the ballot questions, talking to folks about that. Um, but I remember on Chris's campaign, uh, for the first round of canvassing, he just wanted us to ask the question to folks, what do you want to see improved in Waltham? What issues do you have in Waltham? Um, he, he didn't want to talk about his platform. He didn't want to you know, hand them a flyer. He really wanted to, and I think he understands that you know, when you go and you knock on that door, this may be one of the few opportunities you have to talk with this person. And we collected a bunch of answers about what are important to our neighbors. Um, some had nothing to say, very little, um, but some did have a lot. I had a long conversation with a woman who grew up in Waltham, um, but now struggling to pay housing and you know, keep her children in the community and your family. And you know, you, you know when you open the door and you see parents with children running around with toys or halfway through dinner, um, you know, who are really focused on the quality of the schools and the safety of their family. And these are pieces, these are people in the community, um, pieces of information that you just won't learn any other ways. And really having a campaign, having a political campaign is one of the few ways that you can see this. Um, and also something that I think we all know as Waltham residents, but we may not fully comprehend is the diversity in our community. Um, so many doors you knock on and you realize that, you know, you have neighbors that don't speak English. Um, we tend to self-select our social circles, you know, they tend to look like us, um, and it's really eye-opening meeting all of your neighbors. So you see different cultures, different living situations, um, and you see lots of people, many groups, who might not spend time out in public, um, maybe the very elderly, or maybe people with disabilities. Um, and it's something that, you know, we all know that Waltham is a diverse city, um, but when you look at uh, the people who are active in the community, the people who are elected officials, um, you know, it may not click truly how um, unrepresentative that is of the community at a whole. Um, and it, it really helps you understand uh, your neighbors and your neighborhood. Also, when you talk to people at the door, it gives people a method of communication that maybe they otherwise didn't want to use. Um, so there's, I know the farm has been a hot topic uh, over the past few weeks, few months, and I know some people have been, you know, emailing city councilors, but that requires them to know what the issue is, um, to know who to contact, and there are lots of times that, you know, people just don't want to reach out and they don't want to email. Um, but by going to people and asking them what is important to them, um, what issues they are thinking about, um, it really is a more opening and a more you come from a position of listening and understanding um, rather than expecting them to reach out when something is uh, concerning them when they want something changed. Um, so it's really important to have campaigns and to be able to connect with uh, our neighbors, but to make sure that we can do that, we need good candidates. Um, we can't have a good campaign without a good candidate. And the next step is that to have a good candidate, they need volunteers. Um, you can't run for office by yourself. Uh, you can't knock on every door and talk to every neighbor. Um, I'm sure Colleen tried, but you know, being a volunteer 
uh, means that you will support candidacy, candidates, you will support their candidacy, and you will support contested elections. And that knowing that there will be volunteers and that there will be will people willing to help you um, is a huge step. It overcomes a huge hurdle for potential candidates. So it, it's very important that we can talk to our neighbors, understand their concerns, and build this build a political community in Waltham, not one based on uh, parties or issues, but really the idea of, you know, that the city is this political manifestation. Um, and so that we can build these connections between our neighbors. Um, and being a volunteer uh, allows campaigns to run. Um, so I, I think the work is very rewarding. Uh, I see it being, um, at least for me, you know, near mandatory as a resident. Um, and I hope to see many of your names and many of your faces. Uh, on, on ne next to my turfs in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. Are there any questions? You can either raise your hand and I'll call on you or you can type in the chat. I misspoke earlier when I said our session, our schedule wraps up at 7.30. It actually wraps up at eight, just in case anyone's planning their evening. Heather, do you have a question? I do because um, I I love uh, talking to people who do a lot of volunteering with campaigns um, because one of the things that I'm always curious about is kind of what what draws you to certain campaigns beyond sort of like issues, but are there um, things that you look for? Are there red flags? <laughs> that you look for um, when you're uh, volunteering, because it's it's definitely uh, like Chris was saying, like we're not a small town, but um, you know, to reach out for volunteers, you're always looking for people. And I just, I'm curious kind of um, what kinds of things appeal to people to get involved. I, I think issues is a big one. Um, I, I think, you know, you, you wanna volunteer with something that uh, aligns with your issues. Um, and also looking for something that is um, more uh, close to home, you know, so so it may be that it's my ward instead of something that's at large, um, you know, maybe it's not my ward, maybe it's a neighboring ward, so, so I live on the south side, so something that affects the south side, maybe more so um, than North Waltham, and I think, you know, I, I like to say that I, I, uh, I enjoy volunteering for losing campaigns, um, just because it's ones that, you know, typically they're ones that um, need help, that are trying to do new things, that are getting more people involved in the process. Um, but th there's sort of a combination of things as, as and I, um, it's also, I like to, I like to jump in with uh, two feet. So if there are lots of campaigns going on, I tend to sort of pick one and stick with that instead of trying to split my time. Um, but I know that's just me. So I think lots of people have, you know, different ways that they look at that. But. I see a question from Nick. Go ahead, Nick. Hi. Um, I, what you said about, I like to volunteer for losing campaigns. That got me thinking like, what is kind of, in your opinion, or maybe some of the other um, people who have been candidates can answer this too. Like, what what is a good strategy i guess to to get people to be to to volunteer when they know that the odds are kind of like stacked against them because like you said we have kind of like a lot of non-competitive races and when races are competitive it's very much the incumbent has a huge advantage in waltham so sometimes it's like oh i really want to like root for the other dog but i also don't realistically know if they can win so like how do you overcome that if you have that doubt in yourself or if you're trying to convince someone else to to volunteer for something for a campaign? So when, when I um, talk to people and when I understand that they are, um, you know, definitely gonna vote for the other candidate, um, I always say, thank you for being a voter. Um, Cause I think when you understand that your candidate has better beliefs and better ideas, that it doesn't matter um, how many people vote because eventually if everyone votes and if you believe that, you know, you have the best, uh, idea is you will come out on top. So really what it comes down to on election day is who comes out to vote. And I think when you run campaigns from the idea that I am doing this not for myself, 
but for um, this cause or this belief that I know is good, that even if you lose, it helps organize in the community, it helps um, make connections, um, and it is good for that political process. So what, what I think really strengthens communities is the act of going out, the act of campaigning, um, the way it connects people, the way it, you know, strengthens opponents, um, you know, because now they have to sort of campaign and, and uh, be held account more accountable. So it, it may be a loss on the ballot, but there are still lots of wins for the community um, and on the uh, opponent. You know, it, it makes them run a campaign as well. So that's why, you know, I, I understand if you are thinking about running, how, it, you know, that the victory may seem the most important. Um, but I, personally, I don't mind uh, throwing my weight behind someone who is perhaps an underdog um, just because I know the community building will be um, very strong. Thank you, Amon. Um, I think we need to move on to our next panelist. Thank you so much for being here. That was great. Um, next, we have Emily Citrone, who's also been a volunteer on campaigns. And uh, last year when Heather May, who you just saw asking a question, when, um, she was Heather May's uh, campaign manager when she ran for state rep last year. Um, are you here, Emily? Yes. Hi. Hey, everyone. Um, okay, it's all yours. <laughs> Hello. It's so great to be here. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I see so many familiar faces and some new faces and looking um, forward to getting to know all of you. Um, as Josh said, my name is Emily. Um, and just a little bit about me and kind of how I got involved here in, in Waltham is for me, I've, I've always been that kind of the person who's been interested in politics and what's going on behind the scenes and how everything works. And it's something I always wanted to get involved with. And I've lived in Waltham for a little over a decade. And the more I got involved with community and a better understanding of what's going on and the needs, the more that I wanted to get involved. Um, the first time I ever canvassed was in 2021, where Colleen Bradley MacArthur is also on this call tonight which then ultimately led me to um, supporting Heather and her campaign. And this was actually the first endeavor or the first time I was ever campaign manager. Um, so I learned a lot to say the least. <laughs> and I'm hoping to share a few of those lessons with everyone tonight, whether you are interested in volunteering, getting a better, better state of how campaigns work or interested in running yourselves. This is an important step, no matter where you are in that process, or even if you're just here to learn more, um, I think for me, probably one of the biggest lessons um, is really the importance of being organized to organize others, right? Um, campaigns are a lot of work. Um, they take a lot of time. They take a lot of energy, both physically and mentally. And it's important to have a plan and a strategy overall, as well as day to day. Um, but also within those plans and uh, whether, you know, day to day overall, um, it's also the ability to be flexible, to be resilient because things will change, um, you know, in an instant, everything is happening all at once. Things are happening in real time and you, as you're learning things, you're applying them. Um, so time, um, another lesson is time is valuable and it's also a finite resource. Um, so it's about putting your, you know, term, determining how you want to spend that. What are your key priorities? What's most important? And also trusting yourself to make those decisions, even though you may not have the answers to all of your questions. Um, because, you know, you have in a campaign, things are moving fast. You have certain times. You have to have certain things done and you're doing things kind of all at once. Uh, and then that's where that that resource can be can be finite. <laughs> Um, also, as far as communication, I know it's touched upon it before, clear communication is key, whether it's the messaging, um, how you're communicating within the campaign, how you're communicating with the community. Um, if you're on the same page, if everyone's on the same page, those messages are what is also going to resonate with the community when you're going out, connecting with others, knocking on doors, um, and again, making those connections with voters. If you're 
um, clear about what you're saying and you feel that energy on the doors, those individuals that you're talking to are going to feel that too. Um, and if you are clear what you're saying, then that also helps you to listen, to hear what their concerns are, and to be better prepared to have those conversations, even though you may not expect or know what to expect um, going door to door. Um, and it's also about, you know, discovering what channels work, what best, you know, how is, what message as far as getting to voters, um, you know, communicating with your own team, that way everyone's on the same page um, and that message is clear within the community as well. Also, I know this was um, kind of to touch on what Iman said as far as, you know, volunteers, having a supportive team in your campaign is invaluable. The more people involved, the more support you have, you know, it definitely, as we would say, makes the work, getting the load of the work lighter. Um, it also helps to build community within your campaign. And that ultimately, you know, helps you to make those connections with the community as well. Um, you're learning from each other and you're taking those lessons and, and building them into the campaign. Thank you very much. Ellen. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, looks like, oh, I thought I saw a hand raised, but maybe not. Any questions for Emily? Chris, question from Chris. Yes, Chris. <laughs> hey, Emily. Um, Hello. So uh, I really find the role of campaign manager really important, um, especially from running for office myself is, you know, you can be a great candidate, but if you don't organize your time, then you're just at a huge disadvantage. Um, so I'm curious um, if you, there are any lessons learned, like what would you do differently um, if you were to be a campaign manager again? Uh, if you have any thoughts. Oh gosh, I think Chris, to your point, um, as far as being organized, I think, it's doing things sooner. The, I didn't say the sooner, the better. I, I think looking back, I wish I would have done things earlier. Um, but some of the things I just didn't know to do earlier. And I think that's part of the campaign and those lessons learned is that things, again, are happening in real time. And you're applying those lessons or like applying those learning lessons um, immediately and making those changes where that's where flexibility and resilience come into play. But I, you know, I would say yes doing things sooner <laughs> always sooner the better <laughs> if you can it looks like we also have a question from robin hi robin you're on mute robin oh robin, sorry, I, thought you, I thought you unmuted me personally i'm sorry so hello <laughs> thanks hey, for robin. taking the question campaign finance question um when you try to look at people's campaign finance contributions, is the is the campaign manager responsible for filing that paperwork on donations and things like that? Sometimes, but not always. But not always. It depends how the the campaign setups and I would say the candidate's preference as well. Was it Massachusetts that recently changed the rules for what type of banking system they have to use or what banks to put their money in for contributions? Or is it just Waltham? That I'm not sure of. Okay, I, I just know that there was a special list that went out. Um, yeah. But I'm sure someone else can field that question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lizzie, Lizzie can answer too. So <laughs> Colleen and I went through it together. We both got this, you know, you can't bank here anymore because it doesn't electronically file with the state. And so you had to go around and find a bank, pick a bank. And it's, you know, just like this crazy little process. Um, as it turns out, it worked out really well because I just filed, well, Nina just filed the end of the year, which was like a click and a click and it was done. But yeah, I mean, they made this change and I don't know why, but they did. Um, I think it reduces physical paperwork. Um, as for who files, I could speak to my campaign, my treasurer filed. I mean, that was always an anxiety ridden time because you got to make sure everything checks and balances and, you know, neither of us are finance people. So, you know, Post. IT, yeah. Who's legally responsible for the filing? Even though your campaign manager files for you, is it still your signature so you're legally liable for what's on there? 
it's you and your uh, who you designated as your treasurer for the campaign. So you okay. have to file a, a certain set of paperwork with um, it's the Office of Campaign Finance, the Massachusetts OCPF office. And we recently, because of the census, hit a population threshold that now we are part of um we have to be part of ocpf filings we have to use a bank that is certified with ocpf in the state of massachusetts oh, that's who did it massachusetts changed it okay my other question was um if i tried to google to give you a campaign donation it's impossible to find it online it doesn't exist i don't know what name to write on the check can't find it anywhere city of waltham website <laughs> Right, and so it is good um, that those things are kept separate um, between uh, my personal website, uh, my campaign website, and the city. So there's a lot of um, rules around campaign finance. So the, the city can't necessarily advertise, or I can't advertise through the city um, uh, for people to donate to my campaign. Um, Colleen uh, for Waltham.com <laughs> is my website. And there is a donation link. And the I will say just quickly about the campaign finance. When you attend a training for uh, through Mass Alliance or any of those organizations, they'll give you kind of the 101 of campaign finance. Mm -hmm. And now that we are with OCPF, and I know Heather put it in the chat, it's all online. There's trainings. It's super easy compared to how it used to be, where you only had to file with the city clerk. And so that's the difference now is we've reached a population threshold where the state says, hey, you can't really just file with the city clerk, you know, an Excel spreadsheet with a bunch of receipts, <laughs> piece of paper. You have to actually go through a formal process. Uh, so with transparency. Your... So there'll be some transparency. Exactly. That's all public, public information now? Exactly. And it was before, yeah. but it was only up to the city clerk. And, you know, our city clerks did a fine job of, of keeping up with all of that. It's really just that population threshold that we are a real city, we're a big city, and we need to be using this uh, campaign finance system through the state. And I know personally, my treasurer, I mean, when this all got rolled out, she was on the phone with them all the time. They're super helpful. They only want to answer questions to help you get everything in order. Can I ask if how much money financially someone would need to start a campaign for a, um, a, a city seat? That's a great question. And the answer is, um, you don't have to spend any money. Um, I was looking at uh, Marisa's numbers. Marisa Diamond ran for school committee back in 2019, and she went out and campaigned. She didn't use really any paper signage or materials, and she still got 3,000 votes. And that speaks to something that I, I don't know if anyone else will talk about, but I will certainly talk about the fact that this is a mayoral year people are hungry for new candidates. And looking back at those numbers for Marisa, I said, oh my gosh, she didn't hand out one flyer. She didn't do one mailing. And I hope if that's wrong, I have that wrong, she'll correct me at some point. <laughs> um, but, you know, and she still got 3000 votes. So you could, spend, you could spend nothing um, and especially in a year like a mayoral year, you'll get a lot more visibility because people will really be paying attention. Um, I spent just under uh, 20,000 and that was almost every penny that I raised. So I put in probably about $300 of my own money and uh, everything else I raised and I immediately spent. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. And I guess my last question is, is it something that um, you have to raise money every time for now? Is that what you do when you do your campaign parties? I get invitations to these events. Um, what is the standard 
non-embarrassing amount to make a, a, a campaign contribution? What would be, I know a million is great, thousands okay, <laughs> but what would be nice to go to a party that you just spent, you know, like a wedding, but in, if the dish is $100, you want to do 200, cover the dish, you know, like how do you handle it with a campaign event? I think uh, it's around the same etiquette for a wedding, which is sort of what you can afford to give because mm. every little bit helps. Uh, things like a PO box, you know, that's a hundred dollars a year and you want to have that for, you know, your campaign donations. And, uh, that's kind of a little thing, but mailers can be city wide mailers can be a couple thousand dollars, uh, a whack. You're talking about signs, um, yard signs. Those also a couple thousand dollars. Uh, this past year that I ran, I hired consultants and I was looking back and that was also a couple thousand dollars. Um, I'm glad Heather put in the chat. Um, yes. So the, the ceiling is a thousand dollars per person. Um, and, and it's good, but I agree it's limiting. Um, but every hmm, little bit helps. I, I, okay. um, is that a city thing that it's limited to a thousand? I mean, per person or is that government? I mean, bigger That's government, state. state. Yep. Yeah. So a thousand per whack or a thousand a year? Uh, I believe it's a thousand per person, and then is it two thousand per household? I that doesn't it was sound like any money at all, though. That's not logical. How are you gonna even get the flyers out with that? You know. All right, cool. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for listening to my <laughs> rant and questions. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Bye. Thank you, sorry. Thank you. Tom has had his hand up for a little while. Tom, do you have a sorry. question for Emily? Uh, yeah, and hopefully it's a quick answer. I was just curious because you said the biggest thing that you would change going forward or something that's really important is, you know, making sure to do things sooner. As yeah. someone who's been a part of the campaign, uh, soon is a very abstract concept. So currently we are in January of an election year. Like what is the timeline for like campaign forming, candidates, filing deadlines, knocking on doors? Oh, what's the timeline for that uh, in an election year? Sure, um, I wanna say for municipal campaigns and uh, anyone on the call, feel free to jump in. I know signatures, you have to get so many signatures first. Um, so I would say if you are thinking about, you know, running or, you know, it's, I would, I'm not sure those deadlines off the top of my head. And if anyone does, um, feel free to shout them out. But I think, um, okay, Lizzie said pulling papers in May. So I think, um, and anyone who's ever, you know, have done it too, feel free. I would say if, if, if they're due, due in May, you know, really start to get, um, okay. Then I would say if it's May, then start, you know, April, maybe even start of March, uh, just because, you know, you always kind of the rule of thumb is to get more um, than, you know, those 50 that, or whatever the number is required, just so they're all approved and go through and um, for, so that they're verified and certified so you can be on the ballot. And just to clarify, pulling papers due in May, that means you have to get 50 signatures required to be on the ballot by May. Yeah, by the end of May, yeah. And it's different for different, you know, whether it's a state election versus municipal, but yeah. Question from Barb. Uh, yeah, I I was wondering just if we're talking about um, kind of fun. Is it echoing? Sorry. Um, oh, sorry, Bart, I didn't hear what, yeah, if you could repeat that. Yeah, I was just wondering about campaign funds, um, kind of what generally you you spent it on, because I could see, you know, um, flyers and such um, taking up a chunk, but, you know, I'd like to move in a direction of paying people for their time, but I know also volunteer work is very important. How do you, uh, like, Ideally, I would love to pay everyone for their time, but I know that's not reasonable. How did you kind of um, decide, manage that? And did you 
pay a lot of people or was it all volunteer work? Do you want me to jump in? Yeah, Heather, you want to <laughs> <laughs> jump in on that one? <laughs> I think I think that's a really good question. And I, I love question, to yeah. hear people say, you know, that paying people is an important part of what you want to do because I, I do think that that is really important. Um like for for my campaign, I knew I needed a campaign manager. I knew I wanted Emily. And I knew I wanted to be able to pay her right away. Um, I had the privilege of being able to front myself a little bit of money, which you can, you know, do. You can, as a candidate, you can sort of loan yourself money. Whether or not you ever get it back is kind of, um, you know, up to you <laughs> how much you you raise. Um, but that was important because I wanted to be able to, you know, to have Emily have a paycheck. Um, and, uh, so that in terms of like starting earlier, like Emily was saying, um, with fundraising, you know, it's always, it's, it's never too early to start asking people for money really. Um, I mean, I guess you have to have a bank account to put it in, but <laughs> yeah, I think, so I think like paying people and mailers was probably the two things that we spent the most money on. Yes, and you can always feed your volunteers. <laughs> That's something I tried to do as much as possible and make it a community thing, right? Because um, another issue, and it has been on the, I think it's been on um, some bills at the state level uh, for childcare to be reimbursable. But uh, what I did was I, my son's 11 now. And when I helped with the first campaign I did, our kids, the candidate that I was helping, our kids hung out and played together. And, you know, um, Heather's son and my son, are now best friends because every time we went out to campaign, they hung back, um, you know, with uh, our spouses and became buddies. And so we didn't have to thankfully really spend money on childcare, but, you know, that's a real thing too. That's a real expense and that uh, you currently don't get reimbursed, reimbursed for. Um, but I would say, you know, to answer your question, you, you know, it's a really wonderful, awesome thing to to pay people and, and then you get the professional organized help that you really need. But I didn't pay uh, a campaign manager when I ran last time. I paid consultants to help me develop messaging, put me on sort of a schedule. But then my kitchen cabinet, as we called it, my kind of round table of advisors, were all amazing, awesome volunteers, all of whom happen to be women who, <laughs> you know, really wanted to see me succeed. And um, and then I did feed them. So <laughs> as much as I could. Thank you, Colleen. And thanks again, Emily. Um, so to try to get us a little bit back on schedule, I'm going to introduce Lizzie. We'll hear from Lizzie. I'll introduce Heather. We'll hear from Heather. And then we're going to do one Q&A for both Lizzie and Heather um to try to keep things going so um lizzie gellis has been involved in the waltham community in many ways including being our co-founder of waltham pride um but she's here primarily to talk about her experience running for a ward seat on the city council it's all yours lizzie thank you and i will do my best to catch us up so i'm lizzie gellis and four years ago in 2019 i was out walking our dogs with my wife and our neighbor. And I was going around one of the roads that are just in terrible condition. And I said, I'm going to run for office. And they're like, yeah, 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 sure. Okay. And that was not in May. That was, I don't know, in the middle of winter and May came around. And I was also on progressive Waltham site and Chris was posting about, oh, who's I'm sitting at city hall and I'm seeing who's pulling papers. And I said, I'm going to be there. And I went and I pulled papers which I, I mean, I had no experience in this before, but I had to get signatures and 
So on my birthday, on May 13th, it was a rainy night. I went out and I got half the signatures I needed. I went down my block and around, you know, the the other street. And I came, the last house I knocked on is across the street from me. And they're like, at 6.30, they were eating dinner. I'm like, oh my God, I'm really sorry. And they're like, no, eat with us. I'm like, no, 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 it's my birthday. You know, I'm just, this is my present to myself. I'm going to run. So I ran. I knew nothing from nothing. Um, and Chris one day reached out to me and said, I want to go knocking on doors with you. And so I learned from that. We met for coffee. Um, and he said, do you have any questions? And I said, do I run as an openly gay person? I don't know if you remember this conversation, Chris. Um, and we decided that it was important for me to be my true self, win or lose. I'm not going to I didn't hide in the closet at Boston College. I, I was most certainly not going to hide in the closet now. Win, lose, or draw. So that was a start. Um, I'm also Jewish. So that's, you know, another differentiating factor from the rest of the candidates, especially those who I ran against. Um, I learned so much. Some good, some bad, some indifferent. I learned that I love knocking on doors. You have to love knocking on doors. You have to love talking to people, whether they're on your side or, or not, whether, you know, you, you know, there's some definitely some crazy people. I know Colleen and I both had the, the same gentleman who dropped his towel. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like crazy. In the end, clearly, I did not win, but I gained so much. Um, we'll see. We'll see what the future brings. Um, if I had any recommendations, you, you definitely need a team around you, whether it's just volunteers or a paid campaign manager or a consultant to help and a treasurer who's, you know, good with numbers and, you know, figuring things out. The last thing you want to do is have the campaign finance people come after you because that can't be any good. Um, it was it was a great experience. I think Waltham needs change, whether it's on the city council level or I'll even say at the mayoral level, I mean, 16 years is a long time. Change is needed. If there's anyone in this room who's wants to run, raise your hand. I'm sure we can find a few people to back you um, financially, emotionally, knocking on doors. Um, I think that's where Waltham kind of needs to look. I mean, it's a tough sell. Um, we all saw what happened four years ago. Um, but it's important that we all love our city and we all want to see it move in a different direction a little bit, taking climate control into a, a, account, working with affordable housing, helping the immigrant population, not leaving them behind. Everything matters. Um, Waltham was made up of immigrants. And now that those people are now the leaders, we can't leave the next round of immigrants behind. So it's important if you feel that passion and you're not sure, take a chance. What's the worst thing that happens? You don't win. I mean, nobody knew me. No one knew me when I started. And I lost by under 200 votes. And in Ward 1, that's nothing. Ward one has a lot of voters. I mean, Heather's shaking her head. She knows it. Colleen knows it. I mean, it's a big area. And I love knocking on doors. I hated calling people. I could talk to somebody at a door forever. And it was it was great. And Chris was a huge help. And Jonathan Goldman was a huge help. Um, learning how to navigate uh, vote builder and cutting turfs. I mean, these are things that, you know, candidates need help doing cutting those turfs up which is taking your ward and cutting it into small chunks for those of you who don't know so that you can knock on doors on well every day but make obtainable goals each time you go out and you go out and you knock and you talk to somebody and they're like oh, yeah no I'm a republican I'm not I will not vote for you even though it's nonpartisan so you check it off they are strongly against you okay you're not going to waste your time going back to them but somebody who's like eh, I haven't really figured it out okay guess what you're going to see me again and somebody who says yeah I'm, I'm leaning towards you you're going to see me again and somebody who's I'm all in it for Lizzie 
well, I don't have to go back three or four times, maybe just one more time closer to November. Hi, you haven't forgotten. Um, weather plays a huge deal too. It seems silly, but the summers are hot, pounding on doors and pavement. Heather's nodding her head, Colleen's nodding her head. And in October, this magical thing happens. It gets dark. So when you're, you come home from work, you gear up to go out and you're knocking on doors and it's kind of creepy because it's late at night. It's it's dark out and you're by yourself. So everything to like to keep in the back of your head. Um, but I can't say how much I grew as a person for running. Um, and we'll see what the future holds. So, Josh, I did my part there. I mean, have Thank I caught you, you up a little bit? Thank you so much, Lizzie. And as far as we know, Lizzie is the first was the first person to run as an openly LGBT person. Um, and since then, I believe there have been two others. So we're moving in the right direction. And thank you for talking about that aspect yeah. of it, Lizzie. Um, so I'm going to uh, introduce Heather, but I just want to answer sort of respond to something that came up with the chat, which is what do we know so far? about this year's election. Mayor McCarthy has said she's running for re-election. No one else has said publicly so far that they are running for mayor. Um, nobody else has said publicly whether they're running for anything as far as I know, um, except uh, Renee Arena said uh, at the beginning of last year that she did plan to run for school committee again. So we're uh, three of the seats on the school committee um, will be on the ballot this year. It may be that all three are running for re-election, but if one of them is not, that means we, we need candidates. So I just wanna put a plug out there for school committee candidates. And now we can move on to Heather, who you've already met, but now we'll, we'll give her the uh, spotlight. She ran for state rep as we discussed. She's also run for city council. It's all yours, Heather. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, uh, 781, um, not just for tonight, but um, it is incredibly hard to run for office in a city that does not have a newspaper, <laughs> um, and uh, people have a hard time getting local news, and so just thank you so much for what you do. Um, so... Yeah, I actually, Lizzie, I was thinking, I remember the day that the Facebook conversation was going on about whether or not you should run in Ward 1. And we were all like, yes, yes. Um, and I, I think that that's, you know, one of the biggest things, two, two of the biggest things for me. Um, you have to know why you're running and you have to have supportive people around you. Um, and, you know, when I ran for city council, I knew I wanted to run for office. Um, it, it was a part of my world growing up. Um, you know, my, my dad and my grandfather had been involved in politics. I was looking um, today, so they were involved in politics, but for instance, this is my grandpa's I like Ike button. <laughs> so we're we're on opposite ends of the spectrum, but that's okay. Um, but, you know, when I ran for city council, I realized I was like the conversations that I'm enjoying the most are actually about state level issues. And so in reflecting on that, I was like, okay, this is actually the things that I am really, really concerned with. Um, I have a better chance of making change at a state level than I do at a municipal level. And that was just dependent on the, the things that are important to me, um, you know, uh, housing and food insecurity and um, racial inequities, those kinds of things that are very, very uh, close to all of the issues um, that, that we experience. And so knowing why you're running, because there will be times where you are pulled in 800 different directions and you need that sort of grounding, like this 
this is what I'm running for, um, you know, to make change in this or that, or, you know, whatever it is, that's important to you. Um, and then that leads directly into having wonderful, supportive people around you. And, um, you know, Emily Citroni as a campaign manager, Nancy Pratt was in my um, kitchen cabinet. So it was Nick Hammond. Um, like I, I just, I had these people around me who even when I was like, oh, this is just ridiculous. I should just stop. They were like, you're awesome. And you need that as a candidate because sometimes you are just convinced that nothing is working and nobody is listening to you. And it's really frustrating and you need people that pick you up. Um, I think that there are, for a lot of people, we think about our personalities when we decide, are trying to decide to run for office. I, I know I did. I'm an introvert. I don't necessarily love to meet new people. Now, that's unfortunate for someone who wants to run for office. Um, but what I realized was I don't love to meet new people when I have nothing to talk about, but I had so much to talk about and they had so much to talk about. And so like Lizzie said, you have to love knocking on doors. Well, okay. <laughs> but sometimes that love grows and matures over time, right? Um, so it may not be the first thing that you love, but by the end of the state rep campaign, I mean, that it was almost relaxing for me to go out and knock on doors and just talk to people um, because that was where the real like magic was happening was when I would go out and talk to people. Um, I think that, you know, if you're if you're thinking about running. Things like money um, are concerning because it's a. At the moment, it's a necessary evil. And it's difficult, especially if you are to the left, if you're more progressive, because I'm not going to ask real estate developers for money because that's not in line with my values, right? So I'm asking, you know, people like all of you um, for 20 bucks here and 50 bucks here and that kind of thing. And that's what makes the difference. And that's why you have to be out on the doors, you know, talking to people because it's a free resource for you to go out and talk to people. And that's one thing that I think, Emily, you were saying like, um, you know, uh, doing things sooner. Like, I wish I would have sort of realized a little bit sooner that, you know, me on the doors talking to people was both effective but also free <laughs> and um and, and that's that's something that you you just have to 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 do is to go out every day and talk to those people and if you know why you're running um that becomes much easier i also just wanted to say a couple of things about being a woman and running for office um you need supportive people around you because people will say awful things to you. Um, I highly suggest having someone who runs your social media, whether it's a friend, you know, whoever, so that you don't look at it because you will get messages, um, posts, et cetera, where people are just awful to you. And it's not a lot of people. In fact, it's usually just a handful of the same people over and over. Um, but, and Lizzie's nodding. We're like, we know who these people are. Um, but it, it can be incredibly demoralizing. And um, I was lucky, you know, to have Emily and um, I had a former student, Meredith, who was actually out in Colorado but she's a social media person. That's what she does. And, you know, so thinking kind of outside the box a little bit in terms of, I was like, oh, I wonder what Merit is up to. She just had another baby and she's not working right now. Maybe she wants to help me. Um, some people say the worst that can happen is, is that people say no, 
right? I don't think that's the worst that can happen. I think the worst that can happen is that you don't do anything. You don't run, you don't volunteer, um, you know, you, you, you just don't do anything. When people say no, everybody has different reasons for saying no. Um, it can take a while to understand that it's, it's really not personal. It's not about you. It is about them. Um, but people saying no is, is not the worst thing in the world. And I actually feel like having people on the doors say no to me every once in a while, um, made me a stronger person overall. And, and so, you know, for me, I got into the race because transparency was super important to me and we don't have any in Massachusetts and it has to change if we want anything else. Uh, to change in Massachusetts. And that was, you know, Emily talked about figuring out what your message is and staying on message. Um, that was my message was we need transparency. And what I found was it resonated on the doors. When I started talking about it to people, they were like, this is ridiculous. What do you mean we don't record commu uh, committee votes? I'm like, well, <laughs> um, so yeah, you can, you can do it. You can be an introvert um, who hates to talk to you know new people when you don't have anything to say and has a lot of anxiety around making phone calls and asking for money. And you can still run for office. So that that's the message I want to leave. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Heather. So uh, we'll take questions for either Heather or Lizzie, but Lizzie, you have your hand up. Is there something you wanted to say first? I do. And I know that Heather and Colleen and I all experienced the horrible trollers out there. And I know I told both of them and it's what Nina and Jonathan and Chris said to me towards the end, like, stop going on, on Facebook. It is not how it, it is not healthy. Those last few weeks, you are, you know, clearly you are hitting a nerve for people and you are making it close and others don't like it and they say mean hurtful things and politics is definitely a contact sport but you can remove yourself from that part of it and it's much healthier you don't need to read the mean things that people say you just keep your eyes on the prize and focus on election day i mean it was just it's it was brutal um and i don't know what people said towards the end i mean nina i, I doubt nina would remember now but right it doesn't <laughs> matter but it was just going through it you remember going through it it was like oh oh my god so if you decide to run when you decide to run start now get those calluses going because you will need them yep and to that point and and to the point that Chris just put in the chat, um, Emily and I, you know, we talked a lot about um, surrogates, which are people that can go online and make arguments for you um, because they are your kitchen cabinet or your volunteers and they know what you stand for um, and they can engage in that way. And it allows you as the candidate to to stay sort of removed from it. And that's it's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Bard, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I know this is my second, if anyone else has a question, but um, I, as an introvert as well, I was just kind of brainstorming, trying to think. So I was just wondering, like, what kind of things are appropriate for a campaign? Because I know door to door knocking is very important and it kind of is essential like to actually get the votes and I I like heard from people that yeah that's the most useful for actually getting votes but I know personally you know I wouldn't like I normally wouldn't like that interaction so I was wondering about like holding you know forums or public events just to like hear what people are thinking is that like you know what kind of things are appropriate in that way and like how do you you know contact people about that like is that like a more private event or is that 
can you do like a, a library event or something like is all that kind of stuff appropriate yeah i think you know absolutely it's a it's a good augmentation um to the door knocking you know to be able and especially if um you know i really wanted some sort of debate uh with my former opponent um but we couldn't make that happen um sometimes that type of interaction can be really beneficial both for you as a candidate and for voters um because often especially in waltham i've noticed we don't hear from our elected officials very often um so it's hard to accurately know exactly where they are on things because we just don't hear from them um so i i do think that that those kinds of things are really helpful building up um like an email contact list and, and you know things like that is is really important um because that's how you get people you know to events um i think what i heard from my consultants i think colleen and i had the uh the same consultant uh group help us out and you know when you do like facebook events you sort of whoever replies then you cut it in half right <laughs> Um, and so you're you're constantly trying to build that. But yeah, absolutely. If if that's something that makes you feel more comfortable, it's a great thing to do. And they can make really great fundraisers too. Any other questions for Heather or Lizzie or both? Yeah, I was wondering um, for those folks here that might be interested um are there any ways to learn more about um this whole running for office pro process um i think i heard something about a training um where can people like learn more in depth are there trainings available i think um and i i know that there are a couple people on here that would second this um, Mass Alliance is a group that really has had their finger on the pulse of Massachusetts politics for a long, long time. Um, and they do an amazing training. Um, I think Chris has been to it. Emily's been to it. Colleen, Nick. Um, yeah. Okay. I, 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 I confess I have been actually as a volunteer. Okay. There you go. I have to fess up. Um, and, and they are really just so knowledgeable um, and, and they're just wonderful. Um, and I can uh, look up their information and drop it in the chat. Um, and also, if you're um, a woman running, Emerge, uh, I think today actually uh, released their application for their next candidate boot camp. Um, and Emerge is a really great organization. Um, a lot of the information you get is similar to Mass Alliance, but the thing about Emerge is the alumni network. <laughs> and you know, so there are there are those kinds of things that that you want to you know take into consideration um, in terms of trainings as well. Like what are the resources that they give you? Um, you know, I have said I worked with a group called Incorruptible Mass that was very focused on transparency. Um, and on kind of breaking up this boys club that we have in the state house and incorruptible mass was just so valuable to me um, because not only did they give me a lot of information and and almost like training, but they sent volunteers and they held fundraisers and you know those kinds of things um so looking at those groups because there are people also and i i don't think we've mentioned this yet um there are people who will endorse you groups who will endorse you and often that comes with a promise of volunteers or um a donation or you know whatever it might be. Um, and that can be helpful to get your name out there. 
Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Emily. That was a good question. I'm glad the uh, Mass Alliance training came up. I took it too, actually. It's not just for people who want to run. It's for people who want to help on campaigns. And I was interested to learn how media affects local campaigns. And um, one thing I learned is all that nastiness on social media that people were talking about um, really doesn't matter in most campaigns. Like if, if a candidate gets accused of something, it seems like everybody's talking about it, but it's really only like 20 or 30 people talking about it. And that in most, in most elections isn't gonna sway the election. It's really what people hear on the doors that matters. Um, according to that training, doors is the most important thing and phones are the second most important. And, but what we heard, what I heard from Chris and other people who've been on doors is, you know, people don't know what's going on. Like you're starting from scratch talking to them about what's going on. So that's why we've been doing channel 781. So hopefully this year when people knock on doors, they'll meet a few more people who actually have an issue they care about and have some more background on it to talk about. So are there any more questions before Heather or Lizzie before we move on to Colleen? Don't see any more questions. Can um, I, Josh, can I just say one more thing? Uh-huh. Yes. Listen, listen to your gut. Listen to your gut. Um, because Emily, remember the mailing, the early mailing that we wanted to do and our consultants kept telling us no no it's too early it's too early too early and I was like nobody knows who I am and um we finally we just did it and it it changed the trajectory of the campaign so listen to your gut you know this city and you know you so listen to your gut okay thank you Heather and so um, our last panelist, who you've heard from a little bit already, is City Councilor Colleen Bradley MacArthur, who is now in her second year on the council. Um, she won that seat um, in 2021, where she started uh, pounding the pavement, I believe, in March of that year, before <laughs> most of the incumbents had even started thinking about it. Um, and she won her seat. She won. Um, she beat a long-serving uh, incumbent to win her seat, and so we're happy to have her here to share her insight. It's all yours, Colleen. Thank you so much, Josh, and thank you to Chris and the team at Seven Eight One News, because it has been said a couple of times that there's a lack of media and information in Waltham right now. And I was at an event, it was a city cleanup, and I asked someone how they had heard about the event, and they said, Grouch is something, 781 something. And you know, you know, so people are paying attention to what you're putting out there because you know, you are showing up. And that's something that I think is central to this is showing up. What and what that looks like for you may vary. Uh, you may feel like, hey, I'm more of a volunteer type person. I'm more of a behind the scenes type person, but you still have to show up. And so if, um, you know, a candidate is looking for volunteers, show up, volunteer, because we're not going to win anything by being behind a keyboard. And that is the long and short of it. Um, I just wanted to show a quick, I'm a big history person, and I don't know if anybody's read this book on tyranny uh, by Timothy Snyder, and I picked up this book after the 2016 election because I was just feeling really defeated about things that were going on politically at a national level, and uh, page 83 says, to uh, fight against uh, tyrannical uh, movements is to practice corporeal politics. And it says, get outside, put your body in unfamiliar places with unfamiliar people, make new friends and march with them. And back in 2017, when I started getting together with folks like Nancy and Heather and Chris, when Progressive Waltham was starting, that's exactly what I did. I showed up, 
I met with people, I talked with people in real life, real humans. And, you know, I know the pandemic has, has stymied a lot of that, but I will tell you, I campaigned in 21, uh, 2021 during a pandemic and people were psyched to open their doors because they had been sitting around <laughs> their families and their housemates and it was a new person at their door and they were like hey i want to talk to you so even though we're still in a pandemic it doesn't mean that we can't find ways to show up the fact that you're all here tonight that's also showing up and I think about that time when we were learning how to run for office uh, back in 2017, it was all hands on deck. So there was a candidate that I had signed up at the ward level to be her campaign manager. And I know some people were asking earlier about how do you get involved, even though you know someone might not win. And I think at a certain point in the campaign, for in 2017 when I was campaign manager, I didn't even care because I was so energized by the people that I was talking to. And maybe it was a little bit of disillusionment because I was like, we're gonna win this thing. <laughs> and looking back on it, that wasn't what happened, but the goal of starting conversations that hadn't been had in years in that ward, bringing ideas to the forefront and conversations that had never been had in that neighborhood. And this was worth Colleen, we're losing you. We, we lost your audio. Drop and rejoin. Yeah, I love these messages that are like, your internet connection is unstable. Thanks a lot. Oh, <laughs> Thanks a lot, internet. Um, yeah, and so, you know, these conversations had to be had and it wasn't happening until someone challenged the incumbent. And that's why, or one of the whys that you do it because yes, winning is the goal, that's what we all want, but another measure of success is the conversation. And I will say about running, you, if you have a passion, a fire kind of in your belly about an issue, that's gonna propel you. And I think Heather said it really well, the why. Your, your why, what is the fire um, in your belly and what is propelling you to move forward? You also have good ideas. I remember <laughs> where there was a debate for a mayoral, it was the mayoral year in 2019 and I was so nervous and I was sitting there and I had my index cards and Every time I would talk about something, I would sit back and think, someone hasn't already thought of this and they've been here for how many years? Like, huh? Like we haven't had this conversation before. We haven't, you know, talked about why we don't get utilized state and, and federal money for certain programs, uh, housing, climate. I could list millions of things. And so you have good ideas. And that's something that I feel like when you think about yourself, maybe you don't see yourself as a candidate, um, you, you have good ideas, you have a, a curiosity. Um, I was a journalist for a long time, so I was trained to ask questions. And that's another thing that, you know, Josh and Chris and Emily, do really well with 781 News is ask the question. And you'll find, go to a meeting, you will find yourself sitting there asking the same questions that either I might ask or someone else might ask, or then no one asks. And you're like, why didn't somebody ask that? And um, I would say sort of the third thing when you think about yourself as a potential candidate is you know more people than you think you do. 
And that was something that I didn't realize until I ran in 2019 because the numbers came back and I just looked at them again to remind myself that I got something like 4,300 votes and I don't know 4,300 people. I can guarantee you that. But I know just enough people throughout the city that it worked. And, um, you know, I think that the, um, when you're looking inside yourself to think about running, uh, you, you know more people uh, than you think you do. And yes, I did get more votes than Diane LeBlanc for mayor, which was also uh, very striking and, and speaks to the hunger for change. Um, I know we talked a lot about horror stories on the doors and there were a handful. I had some doors slammed in my face, but on the whole, I kept going back to the people who were like, were you born here? Did you, is everyone in your family involved in politics? And I would be like, no. And they would be like, okay, you got my vote. And I was like, wow, that was easy. I didn't really have to do anything. So, you know, I, I think that um, there's a hunger for change. There's a hunger for new people and new ideas. Um, I know we're running out of time and I can seriously talk about this all day and night because I can't imagine myself doing anything else now that I'm in it. So, you know, going out, being a campaign manager uh, was so invigorating and it really, caught fire within me to to want to be a candidate. And, you know, Eamon, you said something at the beginning about voting as kind of like a solitary act. And, you know, this running or being involved in campaigns, even if you don't run, is such a, a community activity. It's a team activity. And I can look at almost everyone on this call and say, I know you in some way, shape or form. And it's awesome. These are the people in my neighborhood as, as they say on Sesame Street. And, you know, um, uh, I am so proud to represent this community and be a part of this community. And I think if you're thinking about running, just remember you you have good ideas, you, you have a passion, and, and you really know more people um, than you think you do. So um, that would be my encouragement. One other thing I will say, uh, I just was looking around my office. Um, I did get not only negative press on uh, social media, but uh, a hate mail campaign. Someone, <laughs> I think I have a pretty good idea who, paid probably around two or three thousand dollars to Colleen we lost your oh, the anticipation at a, very, at a, at a important <laughs> point in the story it's a dramatic pause you may want to try turning your video off and that might help your audio come through clean at least Yes, I'm going to try that because this is this is important um, because I, I don't want people to um, be scared of running and, and having negative things said about you on social media because this mailer also included my letter to. Oh, we lost you again. Letter to who? Audio cut out again. Yeah, no, we can't hear you. I more phone calls from people saying, I got your letter and I didn't know about you as a candidate. And now I'm definitely going to vote for you. <laughs> so I think that um, if you think that, uh, you know, something hurtful or negative is going to be said about you, um, you, um, you might be surprised that uh, it might actually resonate with people in the city. <laughs> Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, yeah, that was a very memorable and exciting part of that election, <laughs> at least for us. I mean, one thing that we should also mention is the, 
the last um, municipal election in the city had about 27% of registered voters turn out. So not just a population, but 27 people, people who are registered and could have just walked in and voted and didn't. And that comes out to about um, something like uh, 27,000 people who stayed home, who were registered and stay home, which is kind of crazy because it means, you know, when it seems like everybody's saying negative things about you, actually, it's still just a tiny portion of the, the city. But also because you can make a huge difference just by finding a new way to get new people to pay attention and care about what's going on in Waltham. There are so many untapped votes out there that anything's possible, really. Um, did anyone have questions for Colleen? No, no questions. Well, we, we uh, had chances to ask you questions earlier, which was very helpful. Thank you. Well, thank you, Colleen. Chris, did you want to make any uh, final remarks before we um, wrap up? Uh, no, I had nothing planned. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thanks uh, for the great retention rate on an event that's really went over time. So thank you very much for that. I'm glad to bring everyone here together. Glad the candidates had a uh, cathartic time of uh, chatting about things. Uh, we don't really have a lot of opportunity to do this anymore. Um, and really looking forward to an a election year uh, working together with everyone. Hopefully we see some new faces, hopefully uh, familiar faces uh, we can work together again. Looking forward to it. Thank you all very much for coming. Yes, thank you. Thank you our... very much. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you for all the panelists for donating your time again. Yeah. And, uh, and for everyone who asked questions. Keep yeah, everyone asked questions. questions. Follow our social media because we will keep you updated right. on deadlines if you're running and everything else we know about the election. And thanks a lot for watching. <laughs>